Chers collègues, merci. Colleagues, thank you very much for coming back punctually so that we could continue our dialogue with Turkey. And I would remind you that we are looking at the combined second and third periodic reports of states parties, reports submitted by state parties under Article 44. At the present time, we are in the question and answer section. And in this case, chapters 5 to 8, health, education, interim measures, the family environment, and we still have three speakers on the list to ask questions. And at that point, we will ask the delegation to reply first to those questions that they hadn't had a chance to answer this morning and in this afternoon's round on the second cl cluster. Mrs. Edu, your questions, please. Madam Edu. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank uh, the Honorable Minister and her delegation for all the responses we have received so far. I'd like to add a few questions to the issue of adolescent health, which has come up already. Um, one is that in 2001, the committee recommended that a comprehensive study be undertaken on all aspects of adolescent health, including early pregnancy, substance abuse, STIs and STDs, including HIV AIDS, so that this study could guide the development of effective policy strategies and programs. I was just wondering whether such a study was ever conducted or you have conducted other kinds of studies on adolescent health. Second, we understand that uh, Turkey has received assistance from the EU and UNICEF to develop life skills-based education program, including parenting education and peer-to-peer -peer education. But the program doesn't seem to be widely utilized, especially by the poorer and lower educator segments of the population. If this is true, what measures are you undertaking to stimulate demand uh, for the use of this um, important program? of life skills-based education for adolescents. Uh, we note in the report, on, again, on adolescent health, that there are many projects and activities that the state party has undertaken. But I am wondering, do you have a comprehensive adolescent and reproductive health policy? And is there an adolescent and reproductive health education program designed according to the different ages of children that is incorporated in the school curriculum and also a pro, an, an appropriate program designed for adolescents who are out of school. So those are my issues on adolescent health. Mr. Chairman, my second issue is on the standard of living and looking especially at Article 27, 26, and so on. Now, we know that, as was said in the Her Excellency's uh, uh, very informative introduction to this morning, Turkey is undergoing a rapid economic uh, uh, changes. The economic growth now makes it perhaps the third fastest growing economy uh, in the world, uh, maybe after China and India. Um, and the State Party is taking many steps to deal with one of its major challenges, which is the regional disparities and the socioeconomic inequalities uh, that exist in the society. Uh, these inequalities and disparities undermine the enjoyment of children's rights. Um, and if you look at some of the information, um, we, we are concerned that children in eastern Turkey, and mainly in the Kurdish populated southeast, a, a region, they suffer severe, severe deprivations in their human development indicators and their standard of living. In fact, the annual poverty uh, study of the Turkish Statistical Office showed that in 2009, 
the proportion of children under 15 years living be below the national poverty line was 25.77%, compared to 18% for the general population. In fact, wherever you find severe child poverty, it is always higher than general poverty among the population and among adults. And also, it, the same study um, of the Statistical Office, TechStat, shows that children under 15 years living in rural areas had child poverty rates as high as 50.15%. Now, such levels of child poverty affect the health situation of children. And we know, again from the data, that 29.9% uh, of the children in the East are considered nutritionally stunted, which is two times the national average. In education, children from these deprived rural and underdeveloped parts of the country, especially girls, are not attending school or are dropping out. So my questions are, what are you doing to accelerate sustained reduction of poverty and deprivation among children, including the adoption of affirmative action measures. We commend the State Party for the efforts that uh, it has undertaken with respect to the conditional cash transfer uh, system. But I'm afraid it seems that the levels so far are still too low to meet the real problems, the challenge, and that the, the levels of uh, cash transfers and so on may not be having the real impact on the lives of the poor children. Um, the totality of the public assistance uh, is said to be about 1% of GDP. So do you have um, uh, measures to strengthen and expand, enhance this uh, CCT program? so that the children who, are, uh, who need it will be really cared for. But at the same time, do you have comprehensive support programs for the families with children, uh, which will be rights-based and which will prioritize children who are at risk of poverty? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Madam Lee, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Um, I have a, few, a, a question on your um, education. You say it's free and compulsory, uh, but we have some reports that uh, of the hidden costs or extra costs that children or families have to bear um, to get good grades, to get diplomas, etc. And could you please uh, be so kind to uh, help me uh, understand the situation a little better. Uh, my second question is, uh, there doesn't seem to be any information on your st in your State Party report on the follow-up to the option of protocol and sale of children, child prostitution, and child pornography. Uh, and also, in response to our list of issues, your written replies really don't deal with the, what we had re asked you to uh, do in the uh, periodic reporting period. We have, in our previous uh, concluding observations to this optional protocol, in 2006, we've asked you to uh, include in the State Party report, in the periodic report, on a national plan of action to uh, address all the issues uh, and um, actions in, that are enshrined in this uh, particular uh, uh, optional protocol, and then also to provide us information on a, a, a new legislation, because you know uh, it's different from trafficking, and most of what you had said previously it w is deals with h trafficking. You have a law on uh, a national plan of action on combating trafficking, but that really doesn't include all the uh, offenses that this particular optional protocol would like you to include. And also, uh, you need to amend your penal code uh, and your criminal code for the prohibition of all the offenses in this uh, optional protocol. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame Morris. 
Ok. Merci. Alors. Right. Thank you. We have these new questions. I would just add something to add on to what Madam Lee said. There are two Council of Europe conventions that we would like you to ratify. You've signed them, but you haven't ratified them. One on cybercrime, that's two, the 2001 convention. I think there was a, when we were looking at the protocol, the optional protocol on the sale of children, there was a gap there. And the other one is the trafficking in human beings, which is from 2005. So we'd like to know where you stand at this point on the ratification of those two conventions. So, Madam Head of Delegation, the menu that awaits you is considerable and we are I will now give you the floor for your replies. Thank you. I would like to thank you, uh, distinguished chairperson. With your permission, I would like to give the floor to two distinguished director generals of family and uh, social policies, and then uh, uh, I will proceed with the social solidarity. Uh, and then, of course, uh, all the relevant agencies will take the floor, including State Statistics Institute, and the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs will take up, and then I will wrap up. Mr. Abdul Qadir will take the floor. Distinguished Minister, valuable members of the delegation and the members of the committee, I would like to greet each one of you with respect. There are many questions waiting. Uh, us. I will try to briefly respond to each one of the questions that were raised. The first one uh, was relating the children living on the streets. You asked for detailed information. Right at the moment, we do have 38 centers, 8,769 children receiving service. Out of them, 644 of them are boarding. 8,125 uh, 8, of those children receiving day daily services, and uh, 269 of them are employed, 1,572 of them do receive education, 935 of them uh, return to their families, 67 of them had been treated for their substance addiction, and 164 of those children uh, were equipped with skills and do have a job now. 5,275 of those children received recreational uh, activity services in the areas of sports and social and cultural activities. And related with the decree in force of law uh, about the ministry responsible for family and social affairs, and uh, the Child Protection uh, DG are carrying out their activities in this framework. In there were uh, there was a question about adoption and what kind of problems are being encountered. Up until now, eleven thousand. Madam Madam Morris. Yes, yes. Thank you. Before we drop the issue of street children children living in the street before we leave that. The statistics you've just given us are very interesting and really quite impressive, but these are services that are provided to children who are in the street. My question is, what is being done to prevent children getting into a street situation on the one hand and on the other? What is being done for those children who are there to be able to exit that situation, to leave it. I, I realize, of course, one thing that is essential is to ensure that they get their education and in that way be removed from that situation in the street. But I'm, I'm not very clear on where the stress in your policy lies in this direction. In other words, both prevention and, second, removing them from a street situation. Uh, 
yes, with pleasure. I would like to provide you that information. After our ministry was established, one of the priority policies of our ministry uh, was to give emphasis to protective and preventive measures. In other words, what type of measures should we take that the child would never be in a position that would require uh, the, the services for uh, them to be taken out of uh, the streets. And we have signed relevant protocols just a few weeks ago. And there are various uh, studies that we've carried out in terms of building awareness and consciousness among the families. If the families would not be taking care of their children, there would be sanctions imposed on them. And uh, personally, our minister declared to every public institution and agency that uh, those measures are to be carried out and implemented in a very strict manner. In spite of all the protective and the preventive measures, if the child's uh, children would end up on the streets, now we do have mobile uh, patrol teams working on the streets. When the children would end up on the streets, they will be uh, they will be uh, pro they will be provided services and would be integrated with the society. I also would like to add something as, a, a, for example, protective measure in uh, the government program that was declared in the parliament. We had uh, the ASIA project, family social support services, just like medical preventive measures through our own specialists in the social policy domain. We will be working with the families on one by one basis, including domestic violence, because we know that in order to cope and deal with all the problems we are facing in the end, we need to go back to the root of the problem. And every family need to have a social support specialist uh, consulting them. In two provinces, we do have two pilot studies together with Hacettepe University. We've carried out trainer after trainers programs, because we do know that only providing economic support is not enough. We are providing significant financial support to the families. It is. It has been increased from 0.5% of the GDP to 1.38% of the GDP in terms of the financial support. But if there is a mental disability in the family, for example, if the mother is mentally retarded or if the father has an alcohol abuse problem, then the problems would persist no matter how much financially you uh, provide them assistance. For that reason, uh, we have developed this project and we will be able to uh, eliminate the uh, problems by equipping the family by problem solving skills. And hopefully next time we appear here in this room, we would be able to quote to you the results of those work that we've started. So adoption uh, issue, uh, adoption was raised uh, as indicated in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, the best interest of the child needs to be protected. For that reason, uh, if possible, the biological family of the child should be uh, raising the child. If this would not be possible, the closest family members, if uh, this is not possible as well, adoption services are available. Up until now, 11,185 of our children have been adopted, but this number is not enough. Again, with the instruction of our minister, including the civil uh, code, all the legislation concerning adoption has been reviewed uh, in order to facilitate uh, in order to accelerate uh, the adoption procedures by protecting the best interest of the child. Uh, in that uh, framework, foster families is of great importance. Improving awareness of um, uh, awareness of the community about a foster family system. Uh, we are carrying out programs. For example, in Denizli province, we have organized a, a foster family festival uh, in order to promote the topic so that we would be able to enable children stay with a foster family instead of an institution, because we all do believe that every child needs a family. 
and at the same time the board uh, to monitor the rights of the child uh, was another question building awareness within the community uh, a nationwide awareness being established under the prime ministry we've established a board uh, to monitor the rights of the uh, child we do have nine ministries represented at the level of undersecretaries and deputy undersecretaries and NGOs. And we do also have, in total, we do have, uh, we do have uh, NGO representatives as well. In total, we have 20 members in this board. So any kind of action, any kind of decision that would relate children uh, would be in the agenda of this board, and the board needs to approve the actions and the decisions to be taken. And all the ministries, uh, line agencies that work about the issues that relate children would be uh, the agenda item of this board, and they need to be reviewing everything in that regard. You've uh, said that the number of the children uh, that are now receiving institutional care, yes, the figures are high, but still, uh, when we compare the figures in 2011, we see that it had been 15,543, whereas in 2012, it dropped to 14,000. 800. So when we think of the best interest of the child, we've started a special program uh, through which we try to return the fa uh, children back to their families. If the reason for the separation of the child from the family was due to financial reasons. So what we have done is to provide the necessary services to the family and help them uh, to uh, acquire their financial I independence that the child would be able to go back to their family, the children would go back to their families, and the family would be, uh, in a way, rescued. In that regard, 35,185 uh, uh, children had been returned to their, uh, to their families. Uh, out of uh, that 35,185 uh, 35, children, 8,766 of them were returned home. You asked another question about affection houses. Affection houses are the type of uh, the uh, system that is closest to the family environment. In every affection house, as we call them, uh, five to seven children do stay. This is different than the institution, closest to the family system. Those are um, double story house type buildings. So if the child cannot make use of the adoption system, or uh, if we don't want the child to be an institution, this is the best available option. Those houses uh, are inside the city areas. There is a caregiving mother, as we call them, in every house. The children share the same house, five to seven of them. So they bear responsibilities. They get socialized with the society. And uh, in every child, they themselves establish their own family and also socio-cultural activities, academic and social success of the children uh, were higher than the other children, 30% higher. Now, adoption is a very clear institution. A child becomes a child belonging to another family. Now, I don't know if you're also talking about the family passport. Then institutions were m mentioned, then family placements. So I would, like us, I would like to be sure that we're talking about the same things. So the question, how many children in adoption? We haven't the slightest idea. How many children are there in the adoption system that has clear legal then the kafala, how many children do you have in the kafala, which is another way of families receiving children? And then there's the foster families. Then you have the large families. Then you have the institutions. So in the reply, I'm not very clear. We seem to be mixing up things. So 
if you could differentiate between the different types, tell us what your policy is. We've understood that you have a policy, and we congratulate you on that, that you seem to be de-institutionalizing these children as much as possible to put them into a family environment. But if you could clearly tell us what you do have, otherwise we'll be rather confused with regard to the different institutions that exist at the same time. So what is the legal framework for each of the institutions, the number of children there, and what is the framework that is there for them? So, so let me try to briefly recode the figures. Up until now, 11,185 children were adopted. 5,247 children are with foster families. Right, right at the moment, 5,247 is the total number of the children that stayed with a foster family. But some of them, they grew and then uh, they've continued with their lives. But currently, as of today, 1,210 children are still staying with foster families. And uh, right at the moment, the last and do we do have a system that we prefer to provide to the children home uh, care and right at the moment we do have 469 children's house and uh, 2696 children are staying in those 469 children's houses you asked uh, about zero to three years of age uh, group. We prefer not to have children between zero to three years uh, of age in an institution because between zero to three years of age, it would not be for the best interest of the child to stay in an institution. We want this group of uh, children, zero to three years of children, to be with a foster family or to be adopted. We try to, uh, we try to achieve our targets in this regard. Right at the moment, we have 1,699 creche uh, for the young uh, children care centers. The remaining number of children is 52,073 children are uh, now taking care of, uh, are being taken uh, care of in these uh, centers. And you asked a question about data collection. Yes, right at the moment, data collection is being realized through various channels, State Statistics Institute and our Director General. But this is not enough for us at the moment. We have a new policy. We're trying to establish family and social services information center system so that we will be able to collect all data in one center and distribute it from here. We have signed a protocol with Tubitak so that we will be able to establish a system named as CHETUS Child Early Warning System. Again, rights of the child strategy document was another question. Uh, throughout the country, for this strategy to be implemented in its full sense and to establish full awareness within the community. We're working all together, NGOs, universities, uh, civil society. There had been a very participatory system that we've included all those parties. And based on these eight main chapters of the convention, we have established the relevant chapters. So as a state policy, a nationwide implementation would be ensured. Another question was about child-friendly cities. Yes, uh, in, these are among the main objectives of the strategy document to have child-friendly cities and child-friendly media. 
Another question was about the complaint system. Uh, we do have a hotline 183. The staff, hardware and the software, they were all renewed. All sorts of complaints concerning the matters about children are immediately being received and put into a process and this is not enough for us. We are having a, a review of what had been done afterwards. And also we have the hotline of the police, 155, and the hotline of the gendarmerie, 156. All of the claims about children, uh, concerning children, are being received one by one. And if there is any kind of neglect or wrongdoing, uh, they are being prosecuted, prosecuted within the criminal or the civil system, depending on the type of the case. The privacy of the children was another issue that was taken up uh, concerning the privacy of the children. Child Protection Law, Turkish Criminal Code and the Constitution has very clear and clear provisions and the articles concerning the individuals who do violate the privacy of the child do face with very serious sanctions. If the violation of the privacy of the child is originating from the family members, again, we do have sanctions that are being imposed. One of the uh, mo one of the, our priorities is the right of participation of the child. While we are uh, drafting a new constitution, uh, in all sorts of decision-making processes, we do have children's assemblies at the school level, at the provincial level. We are trying to ensure the participation of the children at every platform, at every level, not only dealing with the matters that relate children, but also about the matters that relate to society are important for us so that children would be able to speak out their ideas um, at the school assemblies and at the provincial children's assemblies. Uh, children's participation is of great importance for us. For example, uh, now we do have a website of our ministry. There's a special section uh, to which children can uh, online share their views uh, the, uh, on that website, and our ministry is taking uh, those views into consideration. Well, I think you're going a little bit too fast. You're moving from one subject to another. I don't want to go back, but I'd like to talk about participation. The question, the issue of participation actually has two sides to it. One is participation in society issues, what you've just explained, but there's another participation, and that is the participation of children as individuals in the judicial uh, procedures, civil procedures, uh, in particular cases uh, involving separation, divorce, custody of children, criminal procedures as well. And then there are all of the administrative procedures, which are very numerous in the area of education, health, refugee uh, issues where children are always the subjects of decisions and are uh, should have the right to say something. And I'd like you to explain in these various areas and in legislation what is the place of a child. Is there a code, a proce procedure to cover this sort of situation? My colleague, rapporteur, Mr. Kotrani, also has a couple of questions, follow-up questions. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Kotrani speaking, and thank you very much for your replies. Before we move away from the subject of the family, I'd like to come back to the figures, the statistics that were given to us, which did not actually make things much clearer for us. We heard about 11,185 cases of adoption and the others, 5,247, are in foster families, and we've understood that. There are uh, special facilities for children. I, if I understood correctly, maximum of seven children. Let me come back to the figure of 11,185 children who are adopted, these are adoptions. Now, are these full adoptions? Uh, I know that a great uh, 
portion uh, of families are Muslims in Turkey and some of some people apply the kefala system that does not allow a child to actually hold or have the name of the family nor to inherit. So we would like to know whether there's a distinction in your system. That's the question that the that our chairman also asked. 11,185 cases. Are these uh, adoptions or do they, does that number include the kefala adoption system? Now, without moving away from the family and the family itself, we talked about cases of early uh, marriages, of uh, sometimes forced marriages, uh, the committee uh, which uh, combats all forms of discrimination against women, also talked about polygamous uh, marriages. Uh, and after that, we'll be moving to other areas. So if you could give us some information about these issues I've just mentioned, which do have a direct relationship with the place that children have in family relations. Thank you. Well, in terms of adoption, adoption is uh, regulated under the uh, Articles 305 and 6 of the Turkish Civil Code. It's a total uh, legal issue based on court decisions. During adoption, the opinion of the minor, of the child, is always taken. You have to ask the opinion of the child. And the adopting family, starting from the time they adopt the child, treat the child as their own child. From the moment of adoption, the child takes the surname of the family, becomes a hero of the family, has all the inheritance rights in line with the relevant laws and bylaws uh, we have on adoption. And this is subject to court uh, control and the court decisions regulate this. In terms of receiving the opinion of the child, at any point the decisions need to be uh, taking into consideration the opinions of the child. This is in the uh, laws, this is in the civil code. So in terms of uh, guardianship, you also need to take the opinion of the child. About early marriages, the distinguished member of the committee asked the question. I would like to reply with the results of a very recent study. As Ministry of Family and Social Policies, in 2011, we looked for the family structure of the Turkish family. We had economic and social analysis, and a, a very good uh, figure was that marriages under the age of 18 used to be 20% in 2001. Now it has dropped all the way down to 9% marriages under the age of 18. And we attach importance to this 9% figure. And this is the very reason why we are actually increasing the compulsory education to 12 years, because we want to have 0% of early marriages. Both parties need to learn about the damages and the harm of the early marriages. We are following up on the process. But this very recent study indicated that there is a very uh, rapid progress, uh, about 100% improvement we can talk about. M Madam Eileen, about the disability issue. Distinguished chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, I am the general director of uh, services responsible of the disabled people and senior citizens, so I will talk about disability. What kind of support is given to the families with disabled children was a question. I'm very happy to talk about this home care uh, service that we ha are providing. Together with the law on disabled people enacted in 2005, we, provide, we started to provide this service for disabled people, especially children with disabilities, uh, are provided with the service that they can be taken care of with uh, their families in their home environment. We check the income level of the families with disabled people or people who need care. If their uh, family income is less than the third, two thirds of the minimum wage, then the, they will be provided with home care services. So in line with this law, the number of disabled people who benefit from this monthly payment is about 372,000 people, and one third of this, uh, these people are uh, people aged with between 0 to 18 years, and 
130,000 of them are uh, disabled children. So this is a uh, very good uh, news for us. And we also have uh, students who need special education. In terms of supporting their access to schools, we also carried out certain activities between 2004 2005. According to figures, we have had an improvement of 29 uh, folds. So as of this year, about 42 thousand students have been allocated 60 million Turkish liras and their education was supported. In terms of uh, access to education, they were supported the most. Care services is not only going to be limited to this uh, monthly salary paid to the families for home care. We have seen how important uh, it is to support families financially, but we also need to uh, provide uh, better quality services. And we are currently working on this. We are working with a university and we are at the last stage of planning. The caregiving parents or other people who provide home care will be subject to training. How can they better uh, take care of the child uh, in the home environment? They will be trained on this. And as mentioned by Her Excellency, we have the uh, family social support program, starting from the uh, diagnosis is made at the hospital. Uh, starting from that time, a child is considered as a disabled child in Turkey, according to the law. So starting from that moment, a support service will be provided to the child from all perspectives. Currently, we are uh, training the team that will provide the support. We also have day uh, care support centers, whereby we, we uh, are supporting families with children. The child can come to these daycare centers during the day and they will be picked up by their families at night. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, we also started to provide psychological support to families. In our institutions, we have a team that provides psychological support to families, and they will also be providing uh, support to the families at their home environment. We have recently given instructions to our teams uh, so that children who are taken care of at home environment will also be benefiting from the psychological support. Apart from this, we have temporary care services, uh, support services that are provided by our institutions. For disabled people below the age of 18 years, we are also providing a disability salary. This was brought with the regulation annexed to the law uh, enacted in 2005. For early uh, diagnosis, of disabled children, the Ministry of Health is going to give you an answer, but I would like to touch upon a couple of points, especially for individuals uh, that are that have mental problems from birth. We have certain tests, and in terms of uh, detecting uh, hearing problems, we have the uh, different tests, including phenyl uh, catenary, and we believe that these tests actually make great contribution for uh, detection and identification of these children. And families are also being supported after the diagnosis is made. So we have identified the problem, but how is the family going to be supported socially and psychologically after the diagnosis is made? So we are going to have this. And together with UNICEF, we have signed a protocol. And the main subject of this protocol is early diagnosis and intervention. We have three main topics under this protocol. First one is about a research to be conducted uh, in terms of identifying the early diagnosis uh, methods. The second one is a campaign to promote early diagnosis. Uh, we already started this program. And finally, we will have a congress or a conference type of program to promote all these activities. Again, we have the ODES program for early diagnosis. The ODES means uh, support the disabled people program, especially in the eastern parts of Turkey, in eastern Black Sea for instance, because in Eastern Black Sea region, we have high levels of disabilities occurring at birth. So in terms of identifying and uh, making a diagnosis of the uh, disabilities coming from birth, 
We have a grant program under a project. For 2011, 2 million Turkish liras was allocated to 33 projects. And for 2013, uh, we have allocated 4 million Turkish liras. And budget will be increased. And early diagnosis programs will also be supported by uh, family uh, medicine practices. What kind of control mechanism is there in the institutions was another uh, question. In our institutions, we have the uh, control mechanism that is prepared in line with the law, relevant law on social protection, especially in judicial cases, this uh, mechanism is put into force. Apart from this, we also have an internal uh, oversight or an internal control mechanism uh, under the framework of which we have regular controls uh, and supervision of the institutions. But the civilian oversight, which is very, very important, is also going to be developed. We are currently working on this. We want to uh, make sure that civilian oversight is part of the control and supervision uh, efforts. Then inclusive education. Yes, we have institutions, but to what extent do we really implement inclusive education? The Ministry of National Education is going to give you the detailed information. However, uh, I can tell you that there is a great increase in terms of inclusive education. We had very uh, good campaigns uh, pre uh, prepared, which also helped a lot. We have a campaign called Education Enables, and in the last three years, through this uh, Education Enables campaign, the children benefiting from inclusive education increased by 109%. And children who receive uh, assistance and education in institutions, we are following up on them, monitoring them, so that every child who receives education will actually complete his or her education. So all institutions are working very hard so that this will be possible. And almost all the children are still continuing their education. Apart from this, we have individual care programs uh, prepared for each individual uh, child. Microphone, please. Shebnam Afshar Kurnas, Social Assistance General Director. I would like to extend you my best regards. 45% of the uh, budget allocated to fight poverty is directly used for children. Our priority is to make sure that the children have access to basic education and health services. I apologize for interrupting you. We're talking about the disabled. We haven't finished the question of the disabled, so questions of Diagnostics will be responded to by the Ministry of Health, Education, in particular inclusive education. So I'd like to work on individual themes and mm, topics, uh, not by subjects, uh, even if the subject you're going to deal with is interesting. But let's finish up with the persons with disabilities, please. <laughs> In terms of preventing disability in our country, uh, we carry out many health uh, scans in our uh, country. We have metabolic uh, hypothyroid uh, screenings carried out, and all the uh, screenings have been carried out for 2011 for newborns, uh, including phenylketonuria. In terms of cataracts and retinoblastomy uh, for every newborn child we are carrying out uh, tracking activities and for hip dysplasia uh, we are also uh, carrying out the scanning and screening activities Bunlar dışında Apart from all of these, especially uh, we do have a screening program uh, that has been carried out in 33 provinces uh, before the marriages for uh, the thalassemia in those 33 provinces, hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin 
homeopathies and thalassemia screening are being carried out. If, both, if the couple uh, determined to be a transporter, it is not. Uh, it, it is quite probable that they will have problems. For that reason, we do provide them health uh, support so that they would have healthy children. And in any case of a problem that they would encounter, developmental uh, problems that may appear at the congenital phase is being avoided even before the marriage. So let us first conclude Ministry of Health and then we will proceed with Ms. Shebnam, Ministry of Health. You can continue. My name is Ömer Faruk Kocak. I'm the Deputy and the Secretary of Ministry of Health. So if we would need to continue in a holistic approach, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, respond to the questions that related Ministry of Health from the morning session. First of all, I would like to greet each one of you with respect. Good afternoon. Children with disabilities now, we've had the diagnostic side, but I still need to hear from the Ministry of Education, where is, what is the place of a child with disabilities in education? Then we'll deal with other problems. It's not a question of uh, global health problems. We're talking about a specific area, which is children with disabilities. So, all right, Ministry of National Education, Ministry of Health about the disabled children. So, let me try to conclude uh, the uh, from the Ministry of Health, Sibel Ursel. Uh, in the infant age group, psychosocial development to be supported and uh, preventing the risk factors. Uh, we do have an early diagnostic system that is being carried out in two th since 2005 in 81 provinces. Uh, if there is a risk factor coming from the family or originating from the child, uh, we are referring them to second stage health services. Second stage and third stage health services we're trying to uh, be integrated. We have established a newborn pedi pediatric unit like autism type of developmental uh, problems. We are trying to establish diagnostic centers. One of them already started working in Ankara for those type of uh, diagnosis of developmental problems. Distinguished Chairperson, distinguished members of the committee, I would like to greet each one of you with respect. Under the heading of the uh, disabled, we collect them under the roof of special education. Uh, we had 1,000 34 education uh, facilities. We're providing 238,000 students being uh, trained. We do have 49 schools for hearing disabilities, and there are 1,121 teachers teaching 3,830 students uh, for uh, the sight impairment. We have 16 schools, 1,362 students that are being trained by 445 teachers. So I can give you various numbers under various headings. Uh, there was a question about uh, special education being provided in special institutions or special education classes in ordinary schools. So our policy is to keep those disabled students as much as possible together with the other students. Uh, so disabled students with the ordinary students uh, kept in the same environment is our preference. If it is a um, if it is a uh, Preschool education, uh, we try to have 14 students. If it is a, the ordinary classroom environment, we try to have 30 students maximum in one class where there are disabled students included. And uh, we do have 
84,580 students in the uh, elementary, in the basic education, 7,775 uh, students in the secondary uh, school education that are receiving training within the ordinary schools with the ordinary students. And this does not take place in a random, uh, random manner. Both the teachers who are to welcome those disabled students and the ordinary student uh, classrooms, they are informed ahead of time and they do uh, get prepared for the disabled students to be integrated in the classroom environment. Together with the Ministry of Family and Social Policies, the busing system for the disabled students are uh, being used in uh, with transport to 6,901 students in 2004, whereas in 2012, this number increased 36,200, uh, the busing system, I mean, for the disabled students. Yes, President. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And my thanks to all who have spoken about the subject of children with disabilities. I think that we can uh, only welcome the protocols that appear to ha you have uh, established for the early detection of certain specific disabilities. However, I did not quite completely understand the early detection system for specific uh, intellectual disabilities. I've understood that there's a center for the detection of autism and other intellectual disabilities for an assessment to be able to have early diagnosis, early stimulation. But if there's a s one center for all of Turkey, then the situation for people who do not happen to live near that center will, I think, be a very difficult situation. So in that sense, I'd like to know four cases of other syndromes, in addition to autism, which involve an intellectual disability. The information that we've received where to request an assessment, there's an extremely long waiting list, and this is really very important because it's extremely important to be able to have early stimulation and to have early diagnosis, early detection. I'd like to know whether this is true, very long lists. In addition, The committee uh, fully subscribes to what has been said about inclusive education. Indeed, uh, as you have said, and we agree, and we have been reiterating this, namely that the ideal situation is that all children who have disabilities should be in ordinary lecture halls. They should not be in special schools. These are real ghettos, in fact, and they involve separation, uh, stigmatization of children who find themselves uh, in these uh, special institutions. But that they shouldn't be in a special lecture hall or classroom, but they should, they should be in the regular halls, the ordinary halls, with the necessary support staff and with uh, an eye on the numbers of children so that they can be attended to. But we seem to see that there is a very great number of children who are in separate special education system and you have children who are in special classrooms within the ordinary center. Then the number of children with disabilities who do not have any special needs, there are many more than those who have a disability that requires special support. So we'd like to know whether there is a policy to uh, foster or encourage the training of staff or increased resources to be able to move towards a policy where you have true inclusive education. Thank you. Two questions. I would like to respond to your question. Uh, of course, when uh, the children are diagnosed with a developmental disability, they can be treated in various centers uh, of Turkey uh, at the inpatient and outpatient clinics. The autism center that I have mentioned has very advanced uh, examinations and diagnosis uh, for third phase. Uh, 
uh, research and development centers. This is an example. Uh, we would like to increase the number of those type of advanced centers, but it is not the only diagnostic center. So for the inclusive education, 238,000 students are uh, are uh, in need of special education. Out of this number, 148,000 do receive inclusive education. The rest are considered that it would be problematic to be included in the inclusive education system. So may I continue with the edu other educational matters? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Chairperson. I don't know. I heard 220,000, 140,000 were in inclusive education and 140,000 where it's not considered to be worthwhile. I don't, that's, that's what I heard through interpretation. I think you'd better explain that a bit better because what, what criteria tells you that it's not worth it? I think every child is worth it. So I think you need to explain a little bit better or that we get a slightly different interpretation because that's not acceptable. So, disabled children uh, are being considered under special education, for example, hearing disabilities, uh, visual disabilities, autistic ones, orthopedic disabilities. So, there are various titles. The total of all disabilities is 238,000 total disabilities. Out of 238,000 students, 148,000 of them receive inclusive training. The rest cannot be included. Why? Because we think the specialists report us that the remaining, um, uh, the remaining children cannot receive inclusive training within the ordinary system. Reports are being issued by specialists indicating whether the child can be uh, in an inclusive training or into special education. For example, in terms of hearing disabilities, we have 49 schools. Uh, so for in 49 schools, hearing disability specialists are training those children. The equipment, the facilities are designed for them. It is the same thing for visual disabilities as well. Mr. Cardona? Mr. Cardona? Yes. Thank you. I don't think we need to discuss this much longer, but perhaps you could re-examine some of these points of view that the specialists provide you with. It is very frequent in many states, these systems where children with visual disabilities or hearing disabilities are in inclusive education. The teachers have to know sign language in order to be able to communicate with them. The friends in school, if they're included, will very soon also learn the sign language. Experience has shown in comparative law, if you include a deaf child in at the age of five in another classroom with everyone else, within the month all of the companions will learn sign language and they are then all included. So it may be necessary to make an effort, not just a change of attitude or mentality of certain specialists who 
give up on children, but of course you do need resources, media that teachers need to be trained to provide support. But this is not only good for the child with the disability, but it's m far more important for the children without disabilities. They learn to live with their friends who have a disability and that they should not be considered less in any way than any other. Merci, madame. Je crois Thank you, madam. I think we have uh, finished on this. I think we can thank all the ministries that have participated on the issue of children with disabilities. You wanted to say a word, that's fine. But I think afterwards we need to move on to another issue and uh, we have a lot of questions that have not yet been answered. Uh, Distinguished Chairperson, uh, I completely agree with the distinguished uh, member of the committee because we believe that uh, it, to improve uh, the situation of the disabled children, we need to have this inclusive system and we will work with this team to make more of this inclusive education system and we will do it and we will improve it with this team of experts here. We're determined. So health and education, let us continue. I would like to thank you very much. I would like to wish you a very good afternoon once again. Uh, during the first part of the morning session, uh, during the first part of the first session, some questions were raised. Let me start by uh, responding to your questions. One of the committee members uh, concerning the guest houses isn't this a discriminatory action. I would like to thank you for this uh, question. This guest house system is a very innovative approach implemented by Turkey. It is not something that is being used for every mother. This is only valid for uh, risk, high-risk uh, pregnancies in order to enable the high-risk pregnant women to have access to health services when they are in need of it. And those women, if they wish to do so, can stay with their families in those guest houses. So unless they want to, they don't have to be separated from their families. Together with her family members, she can stay in those guest houses. And this is a completely voluntary participation. We just offer the service, and unless they want to receive that service, they don't have to. So it cannot be considered as a discriminatory uh, practice. But the most important of the services that are being provided is that we have a, a hotline 112. When we compare the uh, number of the uh, motor vehicle ambulances and the air ambulances, the number of the available ambulances increased by six folds and the seven folds. And also we do have mobile health care services that do provide uh, health care and monitoring services for the pregnant women in various areas and regions of our country, uh, the, med the family medicine services and the obstetric services, uh, the basic obstetric services are being provided to those women, tr women through the mobile health care services. And in 2000, between 2008 and 2011, uh, out of 4 million pregnancies, 16,000 uh, guest uh, pregnant women have been hosted in the guest houses because of their uh, risk, risky pregnancy that they are going through. I think this would uh, be a response to the question that you have raised. And at the same time, in, uh, you've touched upon uh, mother and infant mortality rates. I can... Uh, talk about the health transformation program that started in 2002 and significant developments were achieved uh, through the health uh, transformation program. Actually, uh, the reason why we came up with this program uh, was uh, that the regional disparities were mentioned. Uh, the social social uh, 
justice and equitable access to health services was the main idea behind this health uh, transformation program. Just like it is the case in all of the healthcare services in terms of uh, child healthcare services, of having equitable access to health services is very important. The statistics will be quoted in a while in great detail, but in the screening studies, neonatal mortalities and uh, also mother and infant mortalities, immunization uh, programs that are being carried out, when we are to compare the figures with the beginning of 2000, with our date, we do see that significant improvements have been uh, achieved and the gap has been decreased significantly. One number that is very striking, according to the um, Millennium Developmental Goals, the targets for 2015, 2015 mortality Millennium Goals were achieved in 2009. We've even exceeded the Millennium Development Goals in terms of mother and infant mortality in 2009. And we are among the first few countries that managed this throughout the world. And when compared with the countries uh, falling underneath our category, we are the best in our own category. And those developments were mainly achieved in the least developed country uh, regions of our country. So when we talk about disparities, we see that those disparities are not only among regions, but those disparities do exist among the families living in the same city and among the same family members. Uh, there are certain social determinants of health and when you are to interfere uh, with the social determinants of health in the right manner then uh, you would achieve good results and the ministry of health is proud uh, to be able to provide the necessary support in that regard in 2002 uh, the health sector had been prioritized among the general policies and within health, uh, children were given uh, extreme priority because since 2002, we do have a minister of health who himself is a pediatrician and this had is, uh, by itself constituted a significant contribution. And also our health budget uh, had increased, but it is not very high at international standards. Yes, that is right. Thank you very much for bringing this up, bringing this issue up. For many years, we have been thinking that the international standards should be reviewed as well. That is to say, in Turkey, access to health services has been 98 percent, according to the World Bank report. And after the universal health insurance system, uh, access went up to 100 percent. So we are a country that provides such a benefit pack package at a universal level. It is 100 percent uh, accessibility. And we are achieving this with 550 uh, $550 per capita, and uh, generally it is very expensive. In Turkey, when we look at the cost of the health services, it is quite low compared to the other countries. So we are providing productive, effective and efficient health services to a lower cost compared to the other countries. For example, in Europe, it is 3,500 euros per capita health uh, expenditures. In the United States, it is around $7,800 uh, per capita of health care cost. Still, it is not a universal coverage. But in Turkey, we've achieved universal coverage with 100% accessibility to $550 dollars per capita and we don't have those uh, long waiting lists uh, whereas 250 dollars in some countries it is 500 dollars for an mri imaging it is only 30 dollars of mri imaging in turkey and uh, in terms of 
transplantation operations it is the same thing we have the highest level of uh, medical service standards applied with very low costs As another question that was raised during the second part, I would like to proceed with those questions. It was related with the refugees, as I have indicated a while ago in Turkey. Uh, we're not only providing health services to our citizens, but also to to other people who are living in Turkey with various with various status. Uh, the first S uh, level medical care services are provided free of charge in Turkey. And all the children, not only the citizens, all the children do receive free of charge medical services. And the refugees are considered to be our guests, not only as refugees. For that reason, there had been some questions about the refugees. Let me provide you some brief information about them. Uh, the number of the one in Gaziantep, Right at the moment, we have 2,850 children, 159 pregnant women. 1,777 of the children had been immunized within the framework of preventive health care services. In Hatay province, we have 6,564 children and 60 pregnant women. No immunization had been uh, needed. In Kilis, uh, we have 5,234 children and 18 pregnant women. 200 immunization had been provided. And in Shanlu Urfa, we have 365 children uh, under this category. And all the health care services are provided on 24 hours base, basis. Uh, specialist uh, med medical doctors and also uh, general practitioners are being provided. Preventive medical care services are being provided and emergency medical care services are being provided. Water, sanitation and hy hygiene uh, are uh, provided and nutritional uh, s uh, monitoring is being provided as well. For communication, we do provide a translator uh, while they are receiving health care services. And, and also in those areas where we uh, provide service to the refugees are being monitored on day-to-day -day basis by the ministry so that we would not encounter any problems. And also the uh, people uh, are the guests, as we call them, the refugees. Uh, they can easily have access to uh, hotlines 112 and 184. And uh, through those hotlines, they can receive translation services as well uh, if they are to receive any additional service. As another question. Concerning the refugees, Mr. Chairperson, I would like to add uh, one more thing. In, the, in those refugee camps, uh, I visited many of them. Uh, generally, 90% of the refugees are women and children. Uh, we have around 20,000 to 25,000 of refugees. As the uh, minister responsible for family and social services, we've provided uh, daycare crash services for those children. Uh, we provided teachers to take care of the children. We've provided uh, women... Uh, training, uh, vocational training, and also translators have been provided. So in terms of physical conditions, they are provided all sorts of support by the Turkish Republic. We are doing our best as the Turkish Republic, but no matter how much we try to support them, the women and the children, the refugees, they are very... Uh, they, they are. They do have anxiety because they want to go back to their countries. They want the violence in their country to come to an end, and they want to go back to their hometowns. And they want us to tell to United Nations that this violence should be uh, stopped in their own country. Many women sent this message over to you. Thank you. Now, we're still on health. We asked questions on nutritional health, on breastfeeding, promotion of breastfeeding, which is apparently not very strong, sexual and reproductive health. Mr. Kotran 
also has a follow-up question. Yes, on... It seems that many girls don't have much access. In statistics, we don't know how many girls were able to get sexual and reproductive health education, and this may have to do with the high numbers of maternal mortality in spite of many, much progress made by Turkey. But if young girls don't have access to all the information on sexual and reproductive health education, it will affect the type of life that they lead later on when they become mothers. So we would like to know what measures the State Party has taken to ensure greater access to sexual and reproductive health education. Thank you. Well, I would like to especially thank you uh, for this uh, question. If uh, I was able to continue, I was going to actually provide an answer for these questions. With your uh, permission, I would like to start by unwanted pregnancies because it was also asked, and then my colleagues will provide you with detailed technical information. This is something very much debated in Turkey currently. Uh, that's why it was asked, I guess. We have to say that this topic is currently not uh, under a legislation or legislative activity. It's just the public still discussing this issue. But after the opinions are taken, this will be brought to the uh, cabinet of ministers by our ministry. And if necessary, let me underline this, if necessary, it's going to be uh, considered by the parliament, uh, by the government as a bill. But currently there is no political decision taken yet. And there is no uh, legislative activity yet. About the other questions, about the more technical details, my colleague will provide you with information. And then I will continue, with your permission, with the other questions. About breastfeeding, I would like to answer your uh, question. Since 1987, Turkey is carrying out the program for uh, baby-friendly uh, hospitals and breastfeeding in line with the international standards. The World Health Organization is providing us with a form uh, according to which we assess and monitor hospitals. And if you have good uh, maternal practices, we award these hospitals with baby-friendly certificates. Currently in Turkey, we have 437 baby-friendly hospitals hospitals uh, that uh, provide 92 percent of all births. We also provide uh, the uh, staff of the Ministry of Health at the primary level and secondary level in terms of uh, breast uh, feeding. Uh, at the provincial uh, level, those provinces who give the uh, baby-friendly certificate to their hospitals, uh, if we have activities in those provinces promoting the breastfeeding, then they are also considered as baby-friendly cities. 19% of breastfeeding figures were given. According to 2008 survey, exclusive breastfeeding during the six months, uh, first six months is 41%. And in 2011, according to the survey we conducted, uh, we know that 60.1% of mothers are exclusively breastfeeding their children in the six, first six months. Apart from this, continuation of breastfeeding uh, up until the age of two years, uh, we have complementary uh, nutrition programs. So after the six months, mothers will also be continuing to provide uh, their children with breast uh, feeding and complementary uh, nutrition. We also provide free of charge vitamin D and iron supplements uh, to 1 million children every year. Last year in a study we conducted, 
The iron deficiency uh, dropped back to 6.3% and anemia also. It used to be 30% when we started these activities. You asked us, do you have a reproductory uh, action plan, sexual and reproductory health plan is considered as an action plan. It covers 2005-2015. And in our uh, country, five important uh, problems uh, that are seen in the field of sexual and reproductive health are planned under this action plan. And in 2015, we will reassess and revise the action plan. And we will prepare a new uh, action plan for the coming period. In terms of reproductory health, you asked about the trainings we provide. As you know, in terms of having uh, access to the society and reaching out to students and children, you must have your health personnel trained in this field. In 81 provinces, we have reproductive and sexual health uh, centers. In these centers, uh, the personnel working in the field are being trained. Sexually transmitted infections, HIV, AIDS, introduction to reproductory health and safe motherhood modules are included in this training. And the family practitioners that are trained with these modules can also help the adults Adolescents and women aged between 15 to 49 years, uh, they also provide the training to these women. I guess my colleague from the Ministry of National Education will talk about this, but we also provide peer training uh, in our country and we uh, have achieved important success. In terms of adolescent health, I also would like to add the following point. Since 2001, we carry out an adolescent program with different international institutions. Within the framework of this program, first we have identified the centers from which the adolescent would be served. We have identified the personnel that would be uh, providing services in these centers and they were trained and we have established 41 uh, youth and uh, health uh, centers and these uh, are centers uh, whereby adolescents can come and get information. This is how they were structured and counseling and health services are provided to young people through the family practice uh, or family medicine system and when the family practitioners uh, are faced with children who want uh, these uh, services they provide them uh, to the young people madam head of delegation I think a 10 minute break would do us some good do you agree fine so we'll take a 10 minute break thank you